episode. Spoilers! Yes, I'm still wearing a Star Wars related shirt, and that's partly because I think the last season of She-Ra did a better Rise of Skywalker than the actual Rise of Skywalker movie. Basically, certain character arcs and plot points had a lot of resemblance to what happened in that movie, but these were done so much better. I'll talk about this more when I get to spoilers. But overall, I enjoyed this a lot. This wasn't a mess like the last season of Voltron, it kept its focus. And most of the character arcs I felt were earned. And despite being 13 episodes, there was almost no filler or padding. The closest thing was the episode where the good guys had to stop on a planet to get fuel for their spaceship. But even that managed to fill in two points. <clears throat> the second is... It might be a bit of a spoiler, but you probably guessed that She-Ra wasn't gone even though she destroyed the sword. But overall, this was a solid season. A few things were left unanswered, but I was okay with that. Maybe if they ever have a chance to do a follow-up, they'll resolve some of those. But this is about as much as I can say without getting into spoilers, so you have been warned. The gayness! It's off the charts! We're getting into the Giga Queer Age! Ah! Oh hell, it broke my gaydar! You invented a gaydar? Yes, it measures gayness with science! More like for the honor of gay skull, am I right? <laughs> Wait a minute. I mean that as a compliment. Yes, this show ended up being really, really gay, and I like that. You see, I identify as LGBT plus A. The A stands for ally. Yes, I'm heterosexual, cisgender, and I still support those other groups. I still insist that they be given all the rights and protections of everyone else. So even though I wasn't really a big shepherd between Catra and Adora, I did like that their relationship got to happen in a way that felt natural. Now this does beg the question of whether the redemption arc was truly earned, also the same with Hordak, but I think it could still work. Mainly there's the question of what they're going to do now. If they decide to do good and help others after it, that is kind of a redemption. That's They're trying to atone. Again, this could also be something that is addressed in follow-ups. Or more likely, a lot of fan fiction. Also, I think it's kind of fitting that Entrapta, the princess who had the biggest problem with friendship, used friendship to help redeem Hordak. And even though he got taken over just a second later, I did think it was really satisfying to see him take out Horde Prime like that. I, I all but just did a yes gesture when that happened. And I guess the show had to throw in a token heterosexual couple with Glimmer and Bo. God, trying to force that agenda on us don't have as much to say about it as I thought I did. I think a lot of that is because so many other people have talked about the show elsewhere, but I will say that I am satisfied and very happy with what they did. And I do kind of hope they're allowed to do a follow-up where they find the last of the old ones and it's on a planet named Eternia, and that's where her long-lost twin brother is. Yes, I know at the moment they're currently doing a completely separate continuity with the He-Man revival, but this could be something that happens after that. And that He-Man thing I am also looking forward to. You have never given up on anything in your life. So don't you dare start now! God damn you bitch! You never backed away from anything in your life! Now fight! 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 God damn it! Fight! 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 Before I finish this video, I need to interject. I was so busy the day I recorded that there were a couple subjects that I forgot to talk about. Such as, how exactly do I think She-Ra did a better Rise of Skywalker than Rise of Skywalker? First of all, I think the redemption of Catra was handled much better than the redemption of Kylo Ren. Now, I'm not one of those who say Kylo Ren shouldn't have been redeemed at all. I just don't think it was handled as well as it could have been. In each of the other two movies, he seemed to be so conflicted, so conflicted, but in the end, he made one of the worst decisions. This time, he seemed determined and set on his way, until a voice from his mother just made him change his mind. I know it's more nuanced than that, but it still didn't feel as fleshed out as it needed to be. There needed to be a few more scenes dedicated to this. Now, of course, Shira had a lot more screen time to work on Catra's redemption, but I've seen shows drop that ball anyway. 
Now, I'm not saying Catra's Redemption was perfect. It still had a few problems, but far less than what happened with Kylo Ren. Although, weirdly enough, I did feel, personally, that Adam Driver's acting improved once he turned good. As I mentioned in the previous video, when he was trying to be just smoldering rage, he instead fell flat. And when he was trying to be conflicted or angry, he felt whiny. So when he turned, even though the writing wasn't done well, I at least felt he was giving the performance some nuance. Then I felt the kiss was deserved better in Shira. Now, if I didn't state it in the previous video, I am not against the Raylo shipping. Personally, I think both the characters are too underwritten to really judge it one way or the other. But my problem with the kiss has nothing to do with that. I simply feel that the movies didn't earn that moment. Heck, I wasn't even a big shipper for Adora and Catra, but I did feel that the kiss was earned this time. Another thing I felt was done better was Hordak's clones versus the Sith audience. Yes, the image of them just standing around looked cool, but that was just about it. She-Ra didn't have the means to nearly animate as much. I mean, you either saw about a dozen being animated or a bunch of lights in the darkness. But I still felt, even with that, She-Ra did so much more with far less. Then there were the main villains. Now, I mean this strictly in terms of writing, not the acting. Ian McDermott is still his usual awesome self. He is just chewing the scenery like it's a gourmet meal and it is magnificent. But in terms of the writing, he is still just there. And he seems to be included mainly for the reason that I really don't like the sequel trilogy. That reason is it seems to be working so hard to say that Return of the Jedi wasn't really the end of that saga. This is. So it doesn't feel like its own thing and it feels all the weaker for it. This story is trying to be its own and that's what it's doing with Horde Prime. And I completely bought him as the villain that wanted to use Deborah Harry's voice to summon Satan. Then there was also the body swapping issue, mainly a gender swap body issue. Although in this case, I didn't think Rise of Skywalker was doing it badly. He needed a new body and Rey was it. And I don't care whether she's supposed to be his granddaughter or the daughter of his clone, the point is she had the genetic material to fit him. But I still think she did it better because he wasn't trying to make possessing Catra an ultimate plan. He was just bringing up the possibility of possessing her offhand as a way to show off the power of his hive mind. Creepy, but effective. And I felt their defeats were handled better. The way she took out Horde Prime could be compared to what Vision did to Ultron, but I don't try to hold it against something just because it's like something else. I tried to take context and execution into account, and this worked just fine. Rise of Skywalker, on the other hand, did not impress me. Another thing I mentioned in the Star Wars video was that I seriously half expected Rey to tilt the lightsabers until they formed a cross. Though I do think there was one aspect that... It's not that Rise of Skywalker did it better as much as She-Ra did it worse. As flawed as it is, I did enjoy Rise of Skywalker, but there were a few parts I didn't like. One of them was how they handled Rose Tico. She had screen time and a few lines, but that's about it. But that is still more than can be said about the Horde trio. At most we got was a mention of them and a shot of them in the finale. That's about it. Yes, both of those did try to advance the characters, such as they adopted a kid, but still, that was barely anything. And with all four of these characters, I really wanted to see more. There was also something I think she did much better than The Last Jedi. Another thing from the last video is that I made it clear I don't hate that movie. I don't even hate that theme, I just do not like how it's implemented in that film. I wouldn't even mind if it was presented in a ham-fisted manner. I mind that it's presented so poorly and inconsistently. And there are many instances that do fit that theme, but the film pretends they don't for... I don't know what reason, because there are similar moments which it pretends it does. Again, it's inconsistent. Now, Shira wasn't perfect about this either, but it was still much better. Even Shira finally ending Horde Prime was less about fighting someone she hated than trying to help those that he was going to destroy whom she loved. And another instance was Shadow Weaver. She had the power to try to take some of Etheria's magic for her own, but she decided against it. She instead went back to save her daughters. Maybe it was partly pragmatic, maybe she knew she couldn't really use the magic, but it was still something. She was trying to save those she loved, even if it was in a really poor way, instead of fighting those she hated. Then there is another topic that I think is largely agreed she handled better, but that actually brings me to my next topic. 
If there isn't a term for this, I'm going to coin the Ding Dong Ditch em Gay Couple. As in, it happens so fast you might as well be going, Ding Dong, this couple is gay, it's canon, and then you run off before anyone can complain. Now sometimes this may be a choice of the showrunners, and other times it may be a choice of the suits. Regardless, I do understand how for some it can feel like at least a bit of a breakthrough, at least some recognition, but after a point I can see why others feel it's just another form of tokenism. Now I don't know if The Legend of Korra was the first to do this, even with kids media, but it is a particularly notable one. They hook up, but it's at literally the last seconds of the show, so that can be a good or bad thing depending on your interpretation. Another recent one was the new My Little Pony show's finale. Not only did it hint that two of the main characters might be living together as lovers, but two of the background characters that were popular among fans were confirmed to have gotten married. The DuckTales reboot also showed that Violet had two dads. And let me just say that right now, the new DuckTales is the gold standard for reboots in my book. But this goes beyond children's media, as the latest Star Wars did show, even if this is still for general audiences. Though I personally maintain that the sequel trilogy would have been a hundred times better if the narrative core had instead been about an epic love story between a defecting stormtrooper and a hotshot Republic pilot, and Rey would be their straight best friend. Though an easier candidate for the worst way to handle this could be the new Voltron. And that's putting aside that just about everything for the last couple seasons was handled poorly. Now this begs the question of are we going to be just stuck at this for a while, or are we going to move beyond it with greater inclusion? I hope we are because there are some examples even with kids shows. According to Rebecca Sugar, the Crystal Gems and Steven Universe are non-binary. So that technically means any relationships between them are same sex. I barely even watch the show when I know about that. Oh, and let's not forget that Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy were always a thing. But that brings us to how she handled it. Now, the first season was an example of this. You basically got just one line confirming that Natasha and Spinnerella were a couple. But then it went further with Bo's dad, and now in the last season, we're just letting it all out. Natasha and Spinnerella have stated that they are married, and of course, Adora and Katra admit their feelings. And that's not even everything the show has done. They also included a trans character in the previous season. Apparently Noel Stevenson has been going around just uh, canoning other inclusions left and right. And unlike the way J.K. Rowling handled it, this seems genuine because she is actually allowing some of it to happen on the show. Now before I get back to the vlog proper, you can look forward to my next video, which is about the Snyder Cut for Justice League. Hey, you want some controversial opinions? I think the new Adventures of Human is pretty underrated. Yeah, it's not perfect, but compared to how silly the original series was, I don't see that much of a problem with it. Alternatively, I couldn't really get into the early 2000s revival. First of all, that opening prologue scene was about as unnecessary as midichlorines were to Star Wars. I mean, it was basically answering questions in a way that not only were we not asking, but they were just raising further questions. For one, we find out why Skeletor has a skeleton face. But that begs the question of why getting his face melted off by acid didn't kill him in the first place. Then we find out why Prince Adam's father is king. But it's in a way that's ridiculous. So we have this all-powerful council of orb people that decided to leave for reasons. Then they declared that the captain of the guard would become king for reasons. And I'm just thinking, man, it's a good thing they explained how he became king. I thought it was something stupid like he was part of the royal family. Good thing they dodged that bullet. But what really got to me was seeing Prince Adam and Tila practicing together. S basically, seeing Adam act like a dumb twerp made me stop watching. If Adam's that big of a fool, I don't see how he could be that much of a warrior as He-Man. I mean, just because the character design of He-Man is the big dumb barbarian doesn't mean he's actually like that. It would have made more sense for Adam to be like, I don't know, Steve Rogers in Captain America 1. He would be someone who has the mind and spirit of a warrior, but not the physical ability. That would be why he needs He-Man to help protect Eternia. Instead, every time I tried to watch it and saw Adam, I was just rolling my eyes. I couldn't buy him as a hero. But back to She-Ra, it just ends with a wave of lesbian energy defeating evil. And if you have a problem with that, that says more about you than anything else.